Hello and welcome to New Jersey Politics with Laura Jones. I am Laura Jones and we are so glad to have you here with us. Today we're going to be discussing a number of pressing political issues facing the state, from transportation and veterans care to the use and abuse of cannabis and dangers of shopping online. We've got a big show ahead. My first guest is Congressman Frank Pallone, a Democrat who represents New Jersey's 6th Congressional District. He served in the House of Representatives since 1988 and is a strong advocate for transportation and infrastructure improvements as well as veterans issues and his work to protect consumers from dangerous products sold online marketplaces. He's here to now just discuss those issues and more. Congressman Frank Pallone, welcome. Thank you for making time to talk to us today. Thank you, Laura. Good to be here. One of the first things I want to talk about is the recent announcement for federal funding that's going right to New Jersey to help fund transit projects and infrastructure projects. So we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Can you break it down for us? Sure. I mean, it's $425 million in federal funds that's been reprogrammed. Of that, 315 goes to New Jersey Transit and 110 to other transportation projects. But the significance of this, Laura, is that this is money that we wouldn't normally get. Uh, in other words, thanks to the governor, uh, Secretary of Transportation, Diane Gutierrez, and myself and others, we basically got the federal government to every August, they reprogram money. And this is money that's been reprogrammed and coming to our state. I think there are only two or three um, other states, you know, like California, for example, that got more money. Uh, but it's for all kinds of projects. So for example, I'm, you know, I'm just looking at a list here. It has, uh, uh, well, the Long Branch project where we were, when we announced this was for a tunnel, a pedestrian tunnel that reconnects both sides of the train station. But there's a Passaic bus terminal, there's a replacement of six bridges all over the state, there's the Hoboken yard improvements. I mean, there's an endless list here uh, of projects that will be done uh, that will help with better transportation and certainly better uh, um, rail service with New Jersey Transit. Well, and the thing about New Jersey, too, it's not just about the people who live here and use these roads on a day to day basis. It's anybody coming in and out of New York, going down to see you're going through New Jersey. It is one of the most heavily traveled uh, road uh, uh, railways every so so much coming and going out of New Jersey. So is it is it difficult from your perspective to be able to make the case of that federal money going to New Jersey? It's not difficult because of what you said in the sense that everyone understands that our rail system uh, is so important to the country, particularly the Northeast. But there's always the bureaucracy, uh, Laura, of the federal government. And, you know, the, historically, they say that New Jersey didn't get, you know, she doesn't get enough money for its transportation. But I mean, this time, we clearly did uh, and showed, you know, that we could uh, you know, that we can maneuver around that bureaucracy, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, well, what about the domino effect as well? With these projects, I would imagine, come jobs for New Jersey, which are very much needed. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking about, you know, $435 million. You're talking about a huge number of jobs that are being created. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, how do you think it's going to, how do you hope it is going to impact commuters and travelers in New Jersey? Well, it was interesting because at the announcement, uh, Governor Murphy said that there was some kind of third party analysis that said that New Jersey Transit was the best transporta state transportation system in the country. And I know I always get complaints from people saying, oh, New Jersey Transit, this or that. Now, of course, maybe the best is still not good enough for them. But I mean, it is interesting that, uh, you know, we continue to improve. Or I, I really should say the governor uh, continues to improve. New Jersey Transit, uh, and so we, you know, this will be major improvements in terms of your ability to move faster and more accurate timetable and all that that kind of thing. Yeah, and one other to question on this topic, because people are always concerned about the environment. Are there any plans to allocate some of this funding towards improving sustainability, reducing carbon emissions in the New Jersey yeah. transportation sector? Yes, absolutely. I mean, a, a, a number of the projects. Um, actually deal with uh, trying to upgrade uh, the uh, transportation systems uh, to better um, react to climate change, you know, and, you know, more violent storms and, you know, preparatory things in the event of a more severe storm or worse weather conditions. So that's true. I forgot to mention it's true. 
the numbers are growing more and more. As you mentioned, uh, people are sick and, and people are dying thousands, uh, almost as many, if not more than who died at ground zero have passed away from health related issues from 9-11, whether they were responding, where they were there working on the pile, where they lived in that area. It, it's, it's astounding those numbers. And, you know, people were, I mean, the first responders, as you know, were just so determined to help people that, you know, a lot of times there, there weren't masks or they didn't wear the masks or, you know, uh, so, and, and as you know, as people get older, all these things have a more negative impact. So we have to continue with this program for a long time. Yeah. One of the other topics I want to kind of shift gears uh, when, when you're talking about first responders is also our veterans in New Jersey. And there is a report issued by the U.S. Department of Justice, which was really critical of the poor treatment of veterans here in New Jersey um, at the veterans state homes that are run in Menlo Park and Paramus. Um, and you, you've been out in front of this issue as well, calling for some strong reforms and re strong reforms in response to this Veterans Home Report. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Well, Menlo Park, which is in Edison, is actually in my district. So, but, I mean, obviously what we're doing affects all the homes, including Paramus. I mean, the problem is that well, I shouldn't say the problem. I mean, the, the, the report detailed the problems. But in order to fix it, you know, I think we need additional federal dollars. And that's what I've been trying to work on myself, Senator Vitale, uh, Senator uh, Cryan. Um, you know, we spoke in the last few days because they chair the, the Health Committee and the Veterans Committee, respectively, that we need to have uh, the, these veterans homes apply for federal assistance to upgrade the facilities and also the training. If you look at that report, it just seemed like a lot of the healthcare people were not really uh, up to the task in, term, in terms of not having the training of how to take care of veterans. And I think a lot of it uh, dealt with COVID, Allure. In other words, during COVID, you know, the situation was much more severe. Maybe people weren't trained to deal with it. But, you know, COVID is on the rise again, and we may have other infectious diseases or pandemics that come along. So we just want to respond to the report. And uh, main thing right now is to try to get some more federal dollars to do some of the things that are deficient in the report. And there were some issues uh, regarding infrastructure and modernizing that infrastructure. Are you able to talk a little bit about that and what's being proposed for some of these veterans homes? Well, the biggest grant program is an infrastructure improvement program that currently exists that we can, that, you know, we can apply for. Um, but, you know, it's not so much, you know, like what you see on the outside is as much as the you know, infrastructure inside. You know, one of the things that uh, we'd like to see is that every veteran would have their own bed. In some cases, there are two in a room. And obviously, when you have infectious diseases, it would be much better if each person had their own private room. So that's one of the infrastructure needs that we're hoping to rectify. Yeah, I mean, I understand everything costs money, but, you know, I, I think it strikes a chord with so many because veterans, they, they never got paid a lot. They were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, and then they're getting substandard care when they need help. You know, they, 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 rush, they, they put their lives on the line, the, the irony there. Whether it's defense, you know, for security and the Army, the Navy, or it's for first responders or it's for veterans, you know, we always have to come up with the funding. And, and, and you know, there's always those that say, oh, we don't need to pay for this. Let's skimp here. And then, then you have problems. So, you know, I do want to kind of get across to the public that, you know, none of these things come cheap. And, uh, you, know, you know, we need to have support with the public for them. Um, and, of course, you play a major role in the media in bringing attention to it. But I know you might say, well, of course, everybody's going to spend money on these things. But it doesn't necessarily, not necessarily the case. Yeah. Well, another vulnerable population is uh, infants. And one of the other issues you're working on, we're trying to get as much as we can into this segment, uh, you're demanding about some online platforms, remove some items that have been recalled and products that have actually been linked to infant deaths. So can you talk a little bit about the issue? How did it come to your attention? What, what's going on there? Because everybody shops online now. Well, the thing is, when people shop online, what they don't realize is that the platform is not necessarily policing the articles to see whether they should be sold. So there are a lot of things uh, that are uh, listed online, often you know sold by a third party, but on like Facebook or or eBay or whatever uh, that uh, have been recalled. 
And there are a number of children's products, you know, uh, certain rocking chairs and sleepers, for example, that were recalled years ago. The manufacturers are not allowed to sell them anymore, but people sell them on the platform uh, and the platform doesn't police it in any way. And so what we're saying to the platforms is that you have an obligation under the law to police this and not sell these recalled products. Um, if you want to find out what, whether the products are recalled, you, there's a website for the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, that you can go on and tell you. But you should not assume that just because it's being sold on you know, Facebook or Etsy or whatever, that this is something that's safe because oftentimes it isn't. And we've had one of the uh, baby rocking chairs uh, had like 100 people die. And it's been recalled since, I think, 2019, almost four years. And it's still being sold today. It's still being sold. Right. I mean, it's definitely buyer beware. It's something that we have to take responsibility for. But do you see this as a growing problem as far as the, le as far as, uh, the uh, government having to step in and really get involved because i mean on the internet it, it's so huge you know how do you even no, begin to tackle a program a problem like that well what we did is uh, last week we sent out letters to all the different platforms and said Look, we want to know what you're doing you have an obligation to not sell these things what are you doing and how can we help you right it might involve additional legislation but if it's been recalled it's not supposed to be sold right so that I don't know that you know, it's, it's more of an enforcement issue, I think. Uh, but we're asking each of them to respond to us and then we'll have hearings. And if we need legislation to say, what are you go doing to prevent these products from being sold? Do you put, I mean, is there any disclaimer? Is there any, is there anything you're doing? Because it doesn't seem like you're doing anything at all. I mean, the day we had the, uh, even today, these things are still being sold. I mean, you can go look now and I have. Yeah. Well, Congressman Frank Pallone is uh, very, very busy at your work in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. Take care. You too. Assemblywoman Ara Dunn is a Republican representing the 25th District of New Jersey and is behind legislation calling for stricter regulations on cannabis products packaging following a rise in incidents of children accidentally ingesting marijuana edibles. She's also calling for mandatory upgrades at veterans homes following that federal investigation. Assemblywoman, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes, absolutely. First, I want to talk about cannabis packaging law. So what can you tell me? What is the problem? What's going on here? Well, uh, I introduced this legislation uh, uh, quite some time ago, uh, when, but recently, just last week, when the Poison Control Center re uh, you know, provided their findings to the public, I said, I've got to, I've got to announce again, really, and urge my colleagues to get behind this legislation and see this pass with regard to packaging, uh, particularly packaging that's quite alluring to children. And we're seeing that there's, within the last year, the uh, ingestion of cannabis amongst children and the poisoning uh, and the, the illness has, been, has doubled in just the last year. And that's in New Jersey alone. Wow, so uh, the packaging, it looks like candy. It looks like gummy bears it, and of course, kids, uh, it, it's, it's not an issue of people buying things illegally. Um, tell us what, what, what you see and what children are seeing. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and I'm so grateful that you, you brought that question up because I'm actually, since uh, announcing this and introducing legislation, I've heard from so many uh, business owners, uh, dispensary operators that are thanking me for this legislation uh, because they're saying we need this structure. We need these safeguards. Uh, to have in place because the packaging uh, is, again, it's very attractive, uh, you know, dancing, rainbow, colorful, you know, bears. What three-year-old or five-year-old isn't going to be drawn to that packaging? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the Poison Control Center, they got involved in this legislation. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, well, you know, we have on our regulatory code, there, there are packaging guidelines. But what we're seeing is they're not being enforced. So really what my bill does is call for the codification of those regulations. Let's see that 
let really be implemented. Uh, and I know the poison control would like to see that as well. You know, this is this is a matter of just education, just like we did when we talked about telling parents how to store detergents away from the reach of children uh, and, and our existing statutes on dealing with uh, alcohol and access for uh, underage minors. Um, it's really it's I would like to see us not be again behind behind things. Let's get ahead of this. This is a, this is newly legalized. And clearly there's there's more things that we have to put in place. And there were children who actually had to go to the hospital upwards of 30 in July alone for ingesting too many marijuana edibles. 30 in 30 days. So so what's happening? You know, and I'm talking to ER nurses in my district uh, that will say it's it's not just children, the adults as well, because of the lack of the information on the packaging and and you know a gummy bear you just kind of you know you you pop it in your mouth and you don't think much of it uh again there's requirements to uh, list dosages and its effect um but we're we're a little bit uh i think in the wild west here and just today it was announced that there'll be more edibles uh that are going to be reaching the shelves of these dispensaries uh, so i i say to the crc that you know the regulatory body get to work, get this in place, and you won't even need this legislation. Yeah, I mean, and I can see that for adults as well. Even when you sit and you look at energy drinks, there's, I think there's a water called liquid death, which actually it really is water. So packaging, it, it can be deceiving, not just, well, especially for children, but for adults as well. Yeah, there's there's so much power, and, and you know, I you might see it in the background here, but uh, I'm, that picture of me with Elmo, I re worked for Sesame Workshop, uh, represented them, and and uh, you know before the executive and the legislative branches, and we worked together on a task force many years ago to address childhood obesity. So we took those lovable characters, those trustworthy characters, off of packaging. Uh, you know, and you see the Happy Meals now have carrots and milk instead of the, you know, the, the soda and the French fries. So there is, yes, there's so much power in packaging and merchandising. Right. Uh, and so we need to be responsible with that. Yeah, and going back quite a while, uh, the tobacco companies, uh, you know, marketed to young people and ha that, that had to change. I don't even think you can buy the candy cigarettes anymore. Well, may maybe, maybe no. on Amazon, maybe on Amazon, you can buy the 70s candy the boxes of the candy, but right. yes, um, those were all those that went away. Yeah. Yeah. So switching from one vulnerable population children to another, and that is our veterans. I want to talk about a veterans home report that was issued by the U S department of justice, which was really critical of the treatment of veterans in state run homes in Menlo park and Paramus. So can you talk a little bit about what has come to your attention and what exactly you're hoping to do, or you think the legislature should do to protect our veterans who are in these homes? Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it could, took some time for the United States Department of Justice to come out with that report. We knew that, that those facilities in our state were under investigation. And in many ways, we knew what was occurring. I heard from constituents and they pleading, saying, we, we've got to do more and better for our veterans. Uh, my father is a Vietnam veteran. And the thought of having him live under those conditions, I, I could never bear it. Uh, but so now it's it's come to it's come to the surface, right? There, there's no denying what has been found. So it's time for us to act. There's legislation that uh, actually I had the fortunate position to serve as a substitute on the Veterans Affairs Committee and get that legislation through. It, it's ready. It's ready to be taken up on the floor. I would call for the legislature to this requires an emergency convening. Uh, so we should, yeah. Can you talk about what upgrades, or maybe not even an upgrade, just a basic uh, addressing of issues that, that are in crisis right now that needs to be addressed in these veterans' homes? Well, and it's systemic, right? Uh, we unfortunately heard about you know some of the the, um, the employees, starting with the, the culture there with the employees, uh, covering things up, um, and, and how it built, right? It, it, the, um, the, the lack of requirements to disclose certain things or report um, just, just made the, the situation even worse. And then of course, isolating the veterans from their, their loved ones. So, so it um, left things in the dark. So you know, calling for more transparency, obviously some major upgrades and modernization to the facilities themselves are required. 
it, long when, overdue. Yeah, when you say it's a systemic problem, are, are we talking uh, more than just financials that we're dealing with? You're talking about transparency. You're talking about more than just we, we need uh, cosmetic, uh, cosmetic improvements, uh, private rooms, uh, better supplies. Can, can you talk more specifically about that? Yeah, like more of a more of a, a holistic approach to to really providing uh, the care and environment that our veterans so so deserve in their you know their really uh, in their twilight years, right? That's why, why, what do we, that's the, that's the legacy we're leaving them and we are not doing a good job at it. And again, we knew that this information was gonna come out. We knew it was happening. And for now the governor to wait, you know, three years later for the, the report to come out um, and just, you know, really, I feel not act quickly yeah. enough. I mean, I, I'm curious, uh, you said your father is a Vietnam veteran. I mean, the veterans, don't get paid a lot of money. Um, they put their lives on the line. They were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. They are they permanently injured, uh, physical issues, emotional issues, lifelong issues, only to end up neglected. It seems. Mm -hmm. that, what, what are your right, thoughts on that? And it's personal for you too. It's absolutely personal. And when I, as a legislator. Uh, when I'm looking at uh, policies that we should be putting in place, my thought is, what what do we want to say as New Jersey and as the state of New Jersey of how we treat our veterans, whether it's they're finishing up their deployments and their active duty and choosing where they want to really establish their their civilian lives, right? Um, they're not coming to New Jersey. It's because we don't we're not prioritizing that, and that's through our budget and through our policies. And we had a chance to do that just this year. Uh, and I, I stood up about that, that we should be doing more to invest in those facilities. And Vietnam veterans, my dad, a Purple Heart uh, veteran, disabled veteran, uh, you know, they're our largest population of veterans in this state and they are aging. Um, right. So right. We, we've, we've, we've got to catch up. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the timeline? So we know people have known there have been issues. Now there's a report. So what type of a timeline are we looking at for implementing upgrades? Well, I, I think we could get that, uh, you know, the, legis the legislation that I'm pointing to that I'm on, that's the vehicle to, to begin the work. And that's why I say we can't wait until November when we return in a lame duck session. We should get back now to address it, pass it, and, um, you know, have it effective immediately and for the agencies to um and to work to coordinate with the federal government uh with the with the united states department of veterans affairs to get this up and running i think that that would lead to the next question of then how how is it funded are there federal funds available is new jersey going to have to look into their budget um how how do you pay for this uh really with, with a combination and that yes with through the through the, the federal government uh, we have COVID relief dollars that are still, there's uh, still unallocated. Uh, and that was something we drew attention to during the budget hearings as well. Uh, and those funds will go away if they're not uh, dispersed by 2026. Right. So there is a, there's uh, so, a timeline. That, time, time is really of yes. the essence. Yeah. I, I, yes. How, how likely do you think it is they are to come back because uh, it's an election season. It's always an election season in New Jersey, it, it seems. And there are so many issues. There is a judicial crisis as well. This, you know, can't wait. Um, what are you hearing from your colleagues? Yeah, you, you read my mind. I was thinking we, we met about another emergency um, and there have been a since and the judicial vacancy issue remains an emergency. Uh, without, you know, the, the suspension of divorce proceedings. Uh, and then in between, there've been some other calls. Uh, Laura, I, you know, I want to remain optimistic and still continue to do my part in being a voice for veterans. Uh, maybe this is, this is where we will come together and recognize the urgency and the gravity of this situation and finally come together. But I have to say uh, so far, um, it doesn't look like we're seeing that from the, the democratic leadership in Trenton. And what about, when it comes to the, the veterans' homes, if you do get these uh, policies in place, if, if the legislature does come back and if they are addressing these and you say that you're hopeful, um, how do you address or how do you hold those accountable for actually implementing 
these proposals, these plans, because you said it's more than just a matter of buying new equipment, of upgrading. It is a matter of transparency and ensuring those who are working there are being honest and, and not isolating veterans, not making them uh, cut off from their family so that they don't have a voice anymore. How do you, how do you address that? But making sure that those, uh, the loved ones who are always the number one advocates, right? And the number one uh, truth sayers, in my view, they, they witness it through their, their own eyes. And so to never cut off that communication, and we, we did make some improvements there that there's an ombudsman's appointed and that um, uh, caregivers and loved ones can be part of, uh, you know, certain advisory panels. And look, I'm, I'm all for, uh, reports and finding because i think you've got to have that on record um but this is this is as we go this is continuous because i'm we can't wait like we just did now three years later for a report to come out and then act well assemblywoman are done we thank you for taking the time and we look forward to hearing back to keeping us a uh, keeping us afoot on on the developments in that timeline thank you so much thank you so much have a great day you too. And we thank you so much for watching this edition of New Jersey Politics. I am Laura Jones, and we look forward to seeing you back here next time.